You are listening to Once Upon a Secret, a novel in the Mirror and Realms series, written by D.N. Leo, narrated by Laura Keene and Liam Chandler. The Multiverse Novels production is made possible by audience like you. Please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to the channel. It only takes a second, but it helps us create more immersive stories for your listening pleasure. Chapter 21. Dr. Thomas turned off the operation light, pulled his medical mask off, and smiled. Kieran released a sigh of relief. He had the same medical knowledge as Dr. Thomas did, so the doctor didn't bother explain to Kieran about Tad's condition. Well, I don't think he'd need to be sedated any longer. I'll give him some painkillers when he's up, the doctor said. Lucky bastard. Kieran muttered. He pulled out his cell phone and turned it on when he saw a message from Detective Adamson flashing. He didn't check the message but called straight back. Adamson, the greeting was brusque and almost grumpy. Then Kieran noticed the time. It was five in the morning. I apologize, Detective. I lost track of time. Adamson snorted. That's all right. Doctors and cops don't work by the clock. I've got good news for you. On the way back from Rufford Abbey, I got a call. Turns out Joe ran to a police station and reported the kidnapping. She put down your name as the contact person. Very smart girl. Because of the case at Mortlake, your name is in my file in high priority, so the station tagged me. Is she all right? Where is she now? She's fine and at the station. I'll call you back later to confirm the status. Is that okay? That's perfect. Thank you very much, detective. I'll give Madeline the good news. Kieran hung up the phone and walked a couple of steps when it hit him, tidal waves of pain in his brain. He grunted, doubled over, and grabbed his head. Dr. Thomas darted over. Kieran couldn't hear anything except a robotic voice from a hollow distance. It's time, Kieran. The enemies are coming. The pain was excruciating, and blood trickled from his nose. All the monitors in the room flashed, and text came across all of them. It's time, Kieran. The enemies are coming. Dr. Thomas helped Kieran to stand. Kieran stood to his full height, towering over the doctor, then slumped to the floor and blacked out. He awoke, lying on the floor, with Dr. Thomas crouched next to him. How long was I out? he asked. About 30 seconds. How often does this happen, Kieran? Kieran sat up. It was 33 seconds that I blacked out, wasn't it? Dr. Thomas glanced at his watch. Perhaps. What does that mean, Kieran? Kieran stood up leaning on a bench for a moment to regain his balance. A long time ago, when I was developing a computer program, I came across a crossover point between alchemy, astrology, and string theory. String theory, as in the context of parallel universes? Kieran nodded. Dr. Thomas chuckled. It's a very strange logic to combine these areas together, like marrying a horse to a kitten. Kieran winced. Well, it would definitely require creativity when it comes to their physical incompatibility. But anyway, my strange combination of theories suggested that a major galactic event would occur every 33 years where exchanges would be made between universes. What sort of exchanges? Energy. Power. Before father died, he told me that a man has to live up to his duty. But if I ever decided against my duty, he would understand. Then he told me to pay attention to 33. I didn't know what he meant, but in the last two weeks, with all the migraines and strange static occurrences on computers, I think it has something to do with the theory. Kieran shrugged. 33 has some theological meaning, but 33 what? Months? Days? Seconds? Dr. Thomas approached Kieran and looked straight into his eyes. It's 33 years, Kieran. It has been exactly that many years since you blew up the head of the goddess of kindness. It was only a statue. Yes, but it was the first time your trait of violence surfaced, Kieran. Your father consulted me on that. I told him it was a violent trait, but he believed otherwise. He called it demon. Kieran shook his head. It's diamond, not demon, Dr. Thomas. The first is philosophical, and the second is theological. Philosophy of what? A virtuous life. Kieran headed toward the door. Please don't tell my mother anything until I figure this out. A blast of cold air greeted Kieran when he walked out of the operation room. Jennifer rushed over from a corner. Tag is fine, mother. He has some internal bleeding, but he's fine now. He'll be up and running around in no time, he said and saw some relief on his mother's face. He knew he had worried her, and he regretted that. He wanted to embrace her, 
But then he thought better of it and let the thought pass. Tag would have dived right in, hugging and kissing his mother without any hesitance, not giving a flying thought to who might be watching him. His brother had a warm personality that Kieran liked, but he would never admit it. That was his problem. He'd never admitted his emotions. Kieran could count exactly the handful of occasions in his life when he'd embraced his mother. Then he glanced around. It wasn't the cold breeze that had blasted him. It was the emptiness of the space. Where's Madeline? he asked. Jennifer stopped on the way into the operation room. She left. She turned to proceed into the operating room, but Kieran darted forward, blocking her way. What did you say to her? His voice was so low that it was hardly audible, but he knew his mother had heard him well enough. Nothing. She just left. You don't know how many times I pushed her away, but she didn't leave. She even stayed with me during my rage, mother. What did you say to make her leave me? I reminded her that she brought you a bullet and Tata a bomb. I just asked her what she would bring us next. Kieran withdrew a step because he wasn't sure of the consequences if he didn't. Don't look at me like that, Kieran. He turned around and strode down the hall. He heard his mother asking from behind, which part of what I said to her wasn't true. Kieran galloped up the stairs to his office and stormed into the control room. He activated the control panel with one hand, and with the other hand he flipped the telecom on and called his security. On the control panel, a large round circle appeared. He coded in and activated the chip in Madeline's cell phone. His hands shook a bit as he finished. He stared at the screen. Within seconds, a small green blinking dot appeared. The round circle on the screen spun like a compass, and the location of the green dot appeared on the screen. Kieran transferred the data to a portable device and hurried down the stairs to the front, where his men had the helicopter ready for him. The first light of dawn painted the sky in hues of lavender and gold, a stark contrast to the churning darkness of the creek below. Kieran leaned forward in the helicopter, his eyes scanning the turbulent waters with desperate intensity. The roar of the rotors seemed to fade into the background, overwhelmed by the pounding of his own heart. There! he shouted. His finger jabbed towards two small figures clinging to a rock in the midst of the raging current. Madeline and Stephen. Madeline's dark hair was barely visible, plastered to her head by the relentless water. The pilot expertly maneuvered the helicopter into position as the rescue team prepared to descend. Kieran's fingers dug into his palms, every fiber of his being screaming to jump in himself. But he knew better. He had to trust his team. Status report, Kieran barked into his headset. A crackled voice responded. Sir, we've reached them. Detective Stephen is responsive. Madeline's condition, it's unclear. The current's too strong for an accurate assessment. Kieran's jaw clenched. Get them out of there, now. Suddenly, the air shimmered, a scent of magic cutting through the metallic tang of the helicopter. The fairy godmother materialized beside him, her ageless eyes holding a mixture of concern and urgency. Kieran, her melodious voice somehow carried over the cacophony, Madeline's fate hangs in the balance. Dark forces from another realm seek her demise. Kieran's head snapped up, his gray eyes blazing. Why tell me this? There must be something I can do. Name your price. The fairy godmother's expression turned grave. The cost is steep, Kieran, and her survival isn't guaranteed even with your intervention. I understand the gamble, Kieran growled. I need to decide before knowing the outcome. That's the thrill, isn't it? She nodded solemnly. Indeed, she might survive without your sacrifice. Or she might not, Kieran finished. What's the price? The sixpence coin for Cinderella. Relinquish it, and you could tip the scales in Madeline's favor. Kieran didn't hesitate. Take it. Consider the consequences, the fairy godmother warned. This will incur Juliet's wrath. Kieran's gaze drifted to the turbulent waters below, where his team struggled with Madeline's limp form. I don't care. I'll give you the coin. You're willing to face Juliet's fury and that of her allies? Yes, damn it, Kieran snapped, fishing the coin from his pocket. Here, take it. As the fairy godmother's fingers brushed the coin, it began to glow. The light intensified until Kieran had to look away. When he blinked back, the coin had vanished in a shower of silver sparks. It's done, the fairy godmother said softly. You've made the right choice, Kieran. You've saved her. 
Kieran's breath caught. You mean she wouldn't have survived otherwise? The fairy godmother's smile was gentle but enigmatic. Love conquers all, Kieran. Remember that. And with that, she vanished. Kieran's calm crackled to life. Sir, Madeline's condition has stabilized. We're bringing her up now. Kieran exhaled shakily, his eyes never leaving the spot where Madeline was being lifted from the water. Hold on, he whispered. Just hold on. Kieran's heart thundered in his chest as the rescue team loaded Madeline and Stephen into the helicopter. His eyes never left Madeline's pale face, searching for any sign of improvement. As they lifted off, heading back to Monciel, he noticed color slowly returning to her cheeks. Her breathing evened out, no longer the shallow gasps from moments ago. He allowed himself to relax, if only slightly. The tension in his shoulders eased a fraction as he watched her chest rise and fall steadily. Love. The word echoed in his mind, taunting him. The fairy godmother's words haunted him. He couldn't love. He wouldn't. Not again. The very thought sent a chill down his spine, colder than the creek water that clung to Madeline's clothes. The helicopter touched down at Monciel, and Kieran sprang into action. He barked orders at the medical team waiting on the helipad, his voice sharp with urgency. Dr. Thomas rushed forward as they entered, his eyes widening at the sight of Madeline on the stretcher. What happened? he demanded, already checking her vitals. Kieran's jaw clenched. Creek accident. How is she? The doctor's hands moved swiftly, professional. Vitals are stabilizing. She needs rest, but she'll be fine. Let's get her to a room. As they wheeled Madeline away, one of the rescue team members approached Kieran with a tablet. Sir, the biological scan results from the creek. Kieran snatched the tablet, his eyes scanning the data rapidly. His breath caught as he spotted a particular detail. This can't be right, he muttered. The team member shifted nervously. Sir? Kieran's eyes snapped up. It says she's 33 years old. Yes, sir. Our technology is quite accurate. I know how accurate our tech is, Kieran snapped. His mind raced, recalling Dr. Thomas's earlier words about the 33-year mark. The public system listed her as 30. The implications sent his world spinning. He strode after the medical team, catching up to Dr. Thomas as they settled Madeline into a room. Doctor? Kieran's voice was low, urgent. The scan shows she's 33. Exactly 33. Thomas's eyes widened. He glanced at Madeline, then back to Kieran. That's significant, given what we discussed earlier about your own condition. Kieran ran a hand through his hair, frustration and confusion warring within him. What does it mean? I can't say for certain, Thomas admitted, but the coincidence is striking. Her age, your accelerated problems with the energy, there might be a connection we don't yet understand. Kieran's gaze fell on Madeline's sleeping form. She looked peaceful now, a stark contrast to the turmoil in his own mind. Run more tests, he ordered. I want to know everything, every detail, no matter how small. Thomas nodded. Of course, but Kieran... Yes, doctor. The doctor's expression was grave. Your mother might have some answers. Kieran's jaw tightened. I'm aware. As Thomas left to arrange the tests, Kieran sank into a chair beside Madeline's bed. He stared at her, his mind a whirlwind of questions and possibilities. Love, connection, fate. Words he'd long since banished from his vocabulary now clamored for attention. He reached out, hesitating for a moment before gently taking Madeline's hand in his own. The warmth of her skin against his palm sent a jolt through him, a reminder of how close he'd come to losing her. Chapter 22 It seemed like decades to Kieran until he saw Madeline open her eyes. Control, he told himself. It amazed him how his ability to control his emotions had diminished rapidly when it came to Madeline. He didn't know how the divide worked or on what basis they were assigned as soulmates. But love couldn't be forced. It was fundamental for any relationship, soulmates or not. That had been his firm belief until Madeline. Now his feelings for her were an uncontrollable hot mess. He sat down at the side of her bed. Yesterday you promised me you wouldn't walk away from me. I might have to break that promise. I only bring you disaster, Kieran. If you come with a package, I'll take all of it. Why don't you give us a chance? She shook her head. I have to find Joe. If we find Joe, will you stay with me or will you go back to New York? The question came as a surprise to her and to him as well. Madeline gave no answer. Is Stephen okay? She asked. Yes, 
Dr. Thomas has taken care of him. He had some minor external injuries, but he's fine. He's already told me about the attack from his end. He didn't know what happened before he got to you. Just after I left Monciel, they attacked me. I don't know how many of them there were, or who they were. I think it was the same people who attacked me at Fosway. They shot at me again. She looked down at her injured arm and frowned. You don't feel any pain now because of the painkillers. We make the best. He smiled and sat on the side of her bed. Madeline, I have a very complicated family. Tell me about it. After we find Joe, and if you decide to stay, I'll tell you what you want to know. His phone buzzed. We have to find Joe first, Madeline said emphatically. Kieran looked up from his phone and smiled. He showed his cell phone screen to Madeline. From the screen, Joe looked at Madeline with a big, bright smile on her face. Her cat-like green eyes glittered, and her long black hair was pulled back in a ponytail. Madeline, Joe yelped in joy. Madeline was speechless. Come on, Madeline, don't do that. I'm good now. I could do a somersault right now, but I don't think it's very ladylike, and I might frighten Mr. Serious Detective here. Joe turned aside and winked at him. I need to cheer her up. Keep talking, Joe, Madeline said. I got really lucky. In the afternoon, after Zen talked to you, a couple, I don't even know their names, broke into the hotel. They beat Zen up pretty bad and let me go. Madeline smiled. The couple told me to hide for a bit before going to the police. So I did. I went to the police early in the evening. Then late that night, Detective Adamson contacted the station and picked me up. I'm in his office right now. Last night I thought, I know, Michael, Detective Adamson told me, it must have been hard on you and everyone involved. I'm so sorry, but I'm fine now. When we finish with the paperwork here, he's going to take me right over to your place. Joe turned sideways. What? You don't know where she is? Kieran leaned in. Joe, I'll send someone to pick you up, Joe grinned. That would be fabulous, thanks, Kieran. Kieran chuckled. I have one more surprise for you, my ladies. He switched on another video call coming from Lily, his one-of-a-kind executive assistant. On the screen, Lily smiled and raised up the small animal. Willows! Madeline and Joe chorused. Tata dropped Willow into the office, and Lily has been taking care of her since then. Kieran said. And the puppy, too, Lily smiled. Which puppy? Kieran asked. The one you adopted after the fire? Lindsay brought them to the office. Kieran swallowed hard and nodded. Thank you, Lily. Lily smiled, waved goodbye, and hung up. He'd have a word with Lindsay, his CEO, later. The CEO of the LeBlanc conglomerate in London should have better things to do than taking in a puppy Kieran didn't want. He smiled at Joe. Joe, why don't you stay for a few days? The doctor said Madeline needed a few days to recover. You know what, Kieran? If I'm Belle and you're the beast, this invitation is the library gift, Kieran chuckled. I'm afraid my knowledge of fairy tales is limited, Joe. Short version, you're a girl's dream, and you're blushing, Madeline. They heard Detective Adamson calling out for Joe. She rolled her eyes. Paperwork, see you soon, love you both. She grinned at Madeline and Kieran and disconnected the call. Inviting Joe to stay. Very clever, Kieran. Thank you. She smiled and linked her fingers with his. As soon as she touched him, he felt a jab of fear. Her touch was the comfort he'd been longing for. But the fear of having it and then losing it was unsettling, and the fear of what came afterward at them both was a suffocating worry. The fairy godmother's words returned to his mind. You've risked angering Juliet and her allies. He hadn't had time to process that information but he had a feeling they were already exposed to the risks. There was no way back. Hungry? He asked. Famished. Then let's fix that. Kieran and Madeline left the room and found Tag standing in the hallway, leaning against the opposite wall with a big grin on his face. What are you doing up here? Kieran asked. Rumor has it that our princess was up, so I just wanted to come to say hello. Madeline smiled, approaching to give Tag a kiss on the cheek. How are you, Tad? Better than you were at dawn. You scared the hell out of my big brother. Tag paused, making a humming noise, then pressed on. You're still mad at mother, aren't you? He said to Kieran. Come on, she doesn't deserve your wrath. Be mad at me. You can punch me if you like. Grow up, Tad. This is as grown up as I can be at the moment. Give me a few more years, will you? Take your time. Mrs. Rutherford is in, and I'm going to introduce Madeline to her famous jam and scones. 
Kieran slid his arm around Madeline's back to lead her down the hallway. Ah, Tad mumbled something. What? Kieran asked without turning back. Mum is waiting for you in the great reception. Kieran slowly turned around as if accepting a challenge. Very well. Would you accompany Madeline to the kitchen? Ah, Mum asked for both of you, actually. Kieran knew what was coming and opened his mouth with the intention of asking Madeline to go to the kitchen to stay out of this, but she had already grabbed his arm. Come on, let's go have a chat with her. He had no choice but to take her with him. Tata followed without making a sound. Chapter 23 The Great Reception Room was used for family gatherings. Jennifer remembered vividly Conan sitting in the chair in front of the fireplace. Her husband had loved to watch her teach baby Tata to walk. He fell so many times trying to run. Conan had gotten a thrill out of a young Kieran presenting him with new chemical formulas that he had mixed from his mother's cooking recipes. Kieran had been only four turning five, but he'd been able to heal many injured wild animals he found in their yard by using things he found in the kitchen and the garden. That pleased Conan tremendously, inasmuch as he was devastated when Kieran mixed his first explosive compound and blew up the head of the Goddess of Kindness statue. Conan had then put the statue in the middle of the yard to remind Kieran of the consequences of violence. But Jennifer knew that wouldn't work for Kieran. She knew her son. And she would do whatever it took to keep him safe and to keep this family together under the roof of Monciel. They couldn't afford mistakes this year. She couldn't allow strangers in the house this year. She knew what was behind the number 33. But she would take the secret to her grave. Revealing it to Kieran would undo his life. She would rather rot in hell than doing that. So for now, she had to eliminate the immediate threat, those strangers in their home, and she had to live with Kieran's resultant wrath. Kieran and Madeline walked in, followed by Tad. Jennifer sat on a chair at the top of a long dining table. I'm sorry about what happened to you last night, Madeline, she spoke gently. They couldn't get to me last night, whoever they were, but I'm sure they'll find another opportunity. You're a reasonable girl, Madeline. I'm sure you won't mind me arranging a late breakfast here. I feel like a morning tea myself. Then we can discuss some family business. Your house, your rules, Jennifer. That's a good sign. We're starting to understand each other a bit better now. Why don't you all sit down? Tag didn't need a second invitation. He grabbed a chair and settled in. Tag travels extensively and has experienced great foods all over the world, but he always craves Mrs. Hat. Rutherford's scones and jam. At one point, he asked me to express post them to him when he was in Africa. Jennifer smiled. Mother, that's not to be spread around. You promised me, Tad had protested. You were lucky you didn't ask me to do that. Kieran smiled slightly. That wasn't luck. I was being smart. You know, Madeline, Kieran's father called this place Mon Ciel, as if this was his blue sky, his heaven, his world. And he wasn't talking about the palace. He meant the family that he loved with all of his heart. Am I correct, Kieran? What are you getting at, mother? Kieran lowered his voice. The LeBlancs were blessed with their fortune, but they were also cursed with secrets, Madeline, Jennifer said. She doesn't need to know any of that, Kieran growled out in protest. As you can see, like his father, my son will do whatever it takes to protect the family's secrets. Mother, Kieran stood up, and as you can see, he was about to bully his mother out of her place. I would never. Then you will give me a fair chance to speak to Madeline. I think she cares for you, so she should hear what I have to say. Don't you agree, Madeline? Madeline nodded. I'll listen, but I'll reserve judgment. There's nothing you can do or say to influence me. Naturally. And Kieran, I will only speak the truth, and if you think otherwise, you can have your say. Of course, that will only happen if you stay. Would you rather stay or leave the room, Kieran? Kieran sat down slowly, giving Jennifer a warning look. Jennifer smiled. Yes, I'd rather you stay. Madeline, Kieran loved his father. No, more precisely, he worshipped his father. Before you object, Kieran, let's say you loved your father very much. Is that better? No response from Kieran. Yes or no, Kieran? Yes, I loved father, Kieran snarled. So much so that your world seemed to stop when he died. So much so that you would not accept his death, although he died from natural causes. So much so that you immersed yourself in natural medicines, 
exotic pharmaceutical compounds, and any and all computer gimmicks that helped you to fantasize about bringing your father back. No, mother, that's not true. We're finished here, Madeline. Kieran stood again, grabbing Madeline's hand so that she would come with him. Did you or did you not create the game character called White Knight? Jennifer spat out the question. What? Tag was astonished. Madeline stared blankly at Jennifer, and then she turned around to observe Kieran. Jennifer continued, You think your old mother knows nothing about what you do? You think you are in charge of the family, and I am living in oblivion in Dublin? Create? So you are the White Knight? Madeline asked, shocked. White Knight is a very critical and advanced program that could change the landscape of science, Madeline, Kieran said. Madeline stared at him. I don't question your motives for creating such a program. I am sure it will benefit humankind and more. But I am questioning your motives toward me. Did you have anything to do with Joe's kidnapping? No? Why didn't you tell me you were the White Knight when Zen asked for it? I didn't say I wasn't. You drugged me at the meadow to take over the negotiation with Zen. Tears welled in Madeline's eyes. Madeline, Kieran approached. It's not what it looks like. So what does it look like, Kieran? We can't start a relationship based on lies. We aren't meant to be together, are we? Tears were streaming down Madeline's face now. I would never tell a woman I worked with those programs. They're violent games. If she didn't know me, she'd think I was a serial killer. Tad chimed in and received a scolding glare from Jennifer. Madeline stood up and headed toward the door. Kieran grabbed her arms. You said you'd give us a chance, Madeline. We need time. His voice was gentle but firm. Will you tell me everything? There can't be any secrets between us, Madeline said. Everyone has secrets they can't share, no matter what, Jennifer cut in. Mother, Kieran growled, turning toward Jennifer. Let me help you elaborate on that, Kieran. Can you honestly say that your wife did not die because of one of your secrets, Kieran? Juliet didn't die because of my secrets. Kieran's voice quieted but Jennifer could see the anger oozing from his pores. His eyes were red, and a vein on his forehead throbbed. She remained seated, staring at Kieran while Tag stood. Perhaps not, because she died for them. She robbed you of your heart, your life, and your secrets. She died for her greed, Jennifer continued. Why would you say that, Mother? Why do you hate me? Kieran flew in Jennifer's direction. Tag darted after him, but he was too slow. Kieran punched the leg of a statue, standing on a head-height column behind Jennifer. It cracked, crumbled, and collapsed to the floor. He braced his hands on the column, trying to suppress his anger. Jennifer didn't even blink. She didn't need to look behind her to see Kieran's expression, because she could read that on Madeline's face. Madeline stepped back, tears rolling down her face. She turned around and headed toward the door. Stephen entered the room just then and saw Madeline, he glanced at the scene before him and gently touched Madeline's shoulders. Madeline, what's the matter? I need to leave. Could you take me out of here, please? You were attacked last night just outside this house. We have to be careful. We haven't found Joe. We could use some help. We found her. She got away yesterday and is with Detective Adamson. Please take me out of here. We can pick her up on the way. On the way to where? The car was trashed last night. Could you calm down? Stay here for a bit and we can sort things out. Stevens spoke gently. I can arrange transportation for you right now if that's of any help. Jennifer's voice was as cold as steel. Lady LeBlanc, if you or your boys do anything to hurt Madeline, I will not let it slide, Stephen growled. Kieran turned his gaze from the ruined statue and directed it toward Stephen. Tad inched forward. Jennifer knew the sight of her sons would intimidate the hell out of Stephen, so she remained silent. They didn't hurt me or anything, Stephen. So why the hell do you look like this? I just need to leave right now. Not until you tell me what happened. What did they do to make you cry? Stephen threw a lethal stare at Kieran. Nothing happened. It's my problem. Let's go get Joe and head back to New York. I don't belong here. Stephen shook his head and stiffened his stance. Madeline huffed out a breath. Stephen, if you want to stay and pick a fight, feel free to do so. It seems there's enough testosterone in the room to do that, but I will leave here by myself. The cheery sound of Mrs. Rutherford humming a country song as she pushed her tea cart echoed into the room. 
Madeline, please stay a bit longer. The people who attacked you last night might still be out there waiting. If anything happens, I don't think I'm in any shape to help you. Mrs. Rutherford entered the room. The aroma of her famous scones with jam and freshly brewed jasmine tea filled the room. She stood at the door and noticed the tension in the room right away, saw Madeline's tears. Morning tea, everyone. Her voice trembled a bit and sank into an awkward silence. Madeline? Kieran approached. Stay the fuck right there, Kieran, Stephen yelled and stopped Kieran in his tracks. Madeline continued to head toward the door and had to step around the tea cart. You too. I said stay, Madeline, Stephen growled. Madeline took one more step and Stephen ran to her. He grabbed her shoulders violently and threw her back into the room. Madeline fell, rolling on the floor. Kieran rushed to her and Jennifer stood up from her chair. Stephen grabbed Mrs. Rutherford, pulled out his gun, and pointed it at her head. Stay still, he commanded the room. Everyone froze. Lady LeBlanc, may I ask for your permission to stay thirty minutes longer at your palace? Stephen asked, a sarcastic smirk on his face. Kieran inched closer to Madeline. I said, stay still, Kieran, or I'll put a bullet in her head. Stephen pressed the gun against Mrs. Rutherford's head. Stephen, what's going on? Madeline asked. I wouldn't have had to do this if you'd behaved and done what I said but you preferred to go about it the hard way. Let her go, Stephen. If I did anything to offend you, then take it out on me, Madeline pleaded. I would never hurt you, Madeline. I know you wouldn't, so let Mrs. Rutherford go. I'll do whatever you say. If you want me to stay here, I will. You will? Yes. Liar, Stephen screamed. She's a stranger. She's nothing to you. I'm your friend, Madeline. Have you ever thought of me? Would you do anything for me? Stephen's eyes sparked with insanity, you never asked for anything. If you'd asked, I'd have done anything for you. She tried to approach him. Stay right there. Stephen raised his gun, aiming at Madeline now. Tag and Kieran rushed Stephen at the same time. Two gunshots discharged from the silencer on the gun muzzle, and both Kieran and Tag slumped to the floor. This has been an episode in Once Upon a Secret, a novel in the Mirror and Realm series, written by D.N. Leo, narrated by Laura Keene and Liam Chandler. You can find the next episode on the playlist. For more information about the Mirror and Realms series, listening order, and related stories, please go to dnleo.com. Thank you for listening. The Multiverse Novels production is made possible by audience like you. Please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to the channel. It only takes a second, but it helps us create better love stories for you and helps others discover the channel.